friends, welcome to episode 217 of Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can, whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft, or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. I'm Sarah. I'm Rob. How we doing, Rob? I'm I'm far a bit better than you. How are you? Uh, you know, shout out to handfuls of painkillers and (laughs) ice packs, uh, for, uh, getting me through the day. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think this is probably my own doing if, uh, if, if I'm being perfectly from honest. From painting? From painting. I have been, uh, 10th edition Warhammer 40,000 just came out and, oh, yeah. uh, I pulled out my old Necron army mm-hmm. from like 5th edition that I haven't touched in a decade. Right. And went, yeah, I'm going to sell this thing off. And then once I got all my troops out, I was like, God, there's a lot of them. Oh, I love them so much. Mm-hmm. Oh, I I can't sell them. That'd be messed up. Mm-hmm. And so, um, instead, I got this bright idea of like, okay, okay, okay. Maybe maybe I'll sell them, but maybe I'll paint them all first. Like, and I can sell yeah. them as like a big, like you know, pro painted full Pretty, army, right? You know? Yeah. And then you know, of course, like it that that lasted that whole thought lasted a whole eighteen hours. You know, I slept on it essentially and was like, yeah. No, yep. no, I'm just I'm gonna keep them and and then you, I I distinctly remember you at breakfast before brunch before our game this past weekend the mouse guard game mm-hmm. just chatting it up with everyone about your 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 army the new additions how it all works so what they did was they went and they made the game fun. Mm. Um, Damn those guys they, for doing that. Well, they they took a lot of like the super <laughs> sweaty competitive stuff, like mm-hmm. and kind of boiled it down into a lot of simple ways. That they removed a lot of barriers for entry. Well, I feel you know? like the the BattleTech did that a couple years back. Actually, five years ago when I was we were at Gen Con, the rules shifted to simplify a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. And like you don't need any of this stuff if you don't want to play with heat. You don't have to. Mm-hmm. Like if you don't want to play with this stuff, you don't crit hits. You don't have to. Yeah. And they really simplified the rules. And I feel like. The way you explained it, that 40K did the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, like, list building is super simple now. Um, and uh, all the army, like, the new the new indexes came out for the 10th edition mm-hmm. uh, rules and stuff like that. And it looks like pretty much every single army, I mean, with some exceptions. Of Obviously, course. There's, there's some nitty-gritty stuff. But um, for the most part, every army, like, they looked at it and went, what makes this fun to play? Like, players who play this army, why are they showing up? Yeah. Why do they reach for this army above all the other ones we offer, you know? Yeah. And how do we make their special rules reflect that thing that makes them fun already? Sure. Uh, for the Necrons, it's the reanimation protocols. We love putting models back on the table after you've worked hard to kill them. Right. And so they're like, cool, we'll just give you, like, a really nice, very easy to adjudicate reanimation protocols. We're going to give models the abilities to buff those reanimation protocols. So if you stack this model with that model with that model, you can bring back just obnoxious amounts of models per turn. Mm-hmm. You know, really great fun stuff. Very archetypical undead. Archetypical. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say so. Uh, but but yeah. yeah, that that between that and uh, like you said, we had our mouse guard game this weekend. I think it was before we get to the mouse guard thing. I think it was funny when we were walking out and you were you were explaining to uh, we were walking out of the uh, grocery store. In fact, mm-hmm. and you had said it was almost like they picked their own particular. They followed the the idiom. Yes, <laughs> uh, idiom, just, sir. Yes, it's, idiom. And it's just I hadn't heard that in so long <laughs> that it just made me burst out laughing. But it's funny. Yeah. That. A, we're, we were talking about that, and at the same time, it's very archetypical, and we're kind of defining idioms a little bit in this. It's all these these simple words that are coming back around yeah. in funny new ways for us. Yeah. But Mouse Guard was wonderful. I think it um, I think it went very well. Mm-hmm. Um, it was chill. It was very easy going, except for the fact that we had a joyous occasion. We had a DM who was laughing hard. <laughs> yeah. Not at most yeah. of us, but at our... I will say fledgling new gamer. Oh, Pamela. Pamela made our weekend by becoming. <laughs> it's it's so the... funny because but both both her and and Wendy are yes. new gamers. Very much so. But like old souls, new gamers. Old souls, new gamers. You yeah. know, uh, people who have been around gamers all of their lives. Oh God, yeah. And decided that you know role playing really kind of wasn't their thing. Sure. Um. But we're willing to give it a shot with the right environment and the right group, and both yeah. decided that uh, this this particular mouse guard game was just the 
after peanut gallery and for long enough. Yeah. yeah, it was was just the type of thing they felt they could they could dip their toe in the water, and they're both taking to it like fish to water, which is, yes. which is really great to see. Asking great questions, diving right in, feeling that they can do things, but Pamela took it to another level. Yeah, so you've you've got uh, I mean I think I think every new role player goes through their like murder hobo phase. Yes. You know. I would totally agree with that, especially in games where there's even an edge of fantasy combat. Yeah. You know. You get that taste of the power fantasy. Um and even the most mild-mannered person uh you know, start seeing those die rolls compounding, and they just ride that wave of enthusiasm, and pretty soon they have left a imaginary wave of carnage behind their imaginary character. Yeah. Um, and everybody was having a great time with that. You know, everybody oh, it was, was wonderful. Was, was to la- see. But it did get a little. It did get a little gruesome. <laughs> a little gruesome. I think gruesome's the right word at a for it. Point, yeah. But at a certain, but I would say we all recognized it. We're all ready to dial it back a little bit. Yeah. But at the same time, just seeing how much terror was coming across his face of like, dear God, is this actually happening? And in within the same breath, laughing out of joy because he made this monster. Uh-huh. He's, like, he's thinking to himself, like, in in eight hours, I am going to be lying in bed next to her. Yeah. And... <laughs> Decisions have already been made. You right, know? <laughs> right, right, right. But uh, so so cheers to our, our DM for a, a wonderful weekend. It and really... cheers to our compatriot player who who blossomed beautifully into uh, uh, a a fledgling murder hobo <laughs> <laughs> and embraced it fully so. blossomed in the same way reaper does in uh, uh in uh yeah. overwatch yeah very die, very die, very much so die. i think there were there were wonderful comments and i will not uh, i will not uh discuss without uh, without addressing it with the group but uh needless to say i i enjoyed so much watching that occur so yep, yep. But uh, speaking of archetypes. Speaking of archetypes. So uh, this actually started as not a question, more of a commentary. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a kind of a question, kind of a commentary. It was a it was one of those like, this was an errant thought. Do you think you guys would like to talk about this? And we were like, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's a whole show. And then Rob and I How many I times were... have we said that? Well, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> And we were uh, was this was this when we went to went to breakfast one day and yeah. um, we were we were like yeah I don't know how we make a whole show out of this because I mean clearly the intent was this and you were like was it though because I think it was more like this and I'm like well see there's a lot to explore there because oh no there's a lot to explore there hey hey <laughs> hey that's, <laughs> hey, that's a, a show, show. <laughs> so here we are so even in just crafting and and making sure we had this uh the show defined the way we wanted to i think we we ran i wouldn't say a foul but we definitely ran through a lot of thoughts on this um so i'm going to start simple because it's always nice to start simple um archetype what is an archetype and definition would list it as a very typical example of a certain person or thing mm-hmm. um so to frame that in tabletop terms a very typical example of a certain character or class um is a good way to look at that um now a lot of people will say doesn't it's not the same thing as a trope and realistically archetypes refer more to the role whereas tropes refer to the personality it is the character that puts the archetype in the cultural significance Mm -hmm. so for instance, you'll have a fighter as an archetype, but you'll have a mercenary as a trope. Like a female mercenary would be a trope. Yeah, I mean, f- functionally, they're very they're close, They're very, though. very similar. And, like, in the, the, the scope of this particular discussion, I don't think that the distinction between the two is, like, terribly relevant... But just know that that's kind of what we're talking about. At the you know, collegiate that... level, we could get we could get heavy arguments. We are not there. Yeah, we well, are the, not there. The, we're impor- gonna... the important takeaway is that an archetype is essentially a broad sort of descriptor of a type of character. Correct. Correct. It is. Uh, in, in the best way that I like to say it is, it is. It has no past. It has no motive. It has no goals. It is a concept. Yes. And that's the thing that you, you level right there. The moment you add a motive to it, it is no longer an archetype. Exactly. Like like, like an example would be wise old man. Yeah. What What is this wise man about? What is he wise about? 
how old is he? Where does right. he come from? Where did he go? Why is his name Cotton Eye Joe? Joe? Yep, yep. Um, none of these things matter. The the archetype is wise old man. That's all you get. That's all. That's what an archetype is. Yeah, and to to weed it out very quickly, it is when defining archetypes versus stereotypes. A stereotype is the end point. It is a defined archetype that often has a predictable and often negative end point. Mm-hmm. So when you basically say, like, it is a female mercenary working for a deposed king with a scar over, you're, you're, making, a, you're making a stereotype. Mm-hmm. And eventually you get to a point where it feels lengthy and now you've defined them in some negative way. And it's even more of a stereotype if you've seen this character three or four or five, ten, fifteen times before. Exactly. Like, mm-hmm. you'll have an archetypical henchman or you'll have a stereotypical lazy, per- terrible shot, often, you know, bad speak, you know, speaking poorly, uh, loyal, only as far as money goes, henchmen. Okay, now I've stereotyped, right? Um, so when we think of story archetypes, not necessarily sitting within the the tabletop realm, we think of the typical Carl Jung 12 archetypes, which is the innocent, the everyman, the hero, the outlaw, the explorer, the creator, the ruler, magician, lover, caregiver, jester, and sage. Most things can fit within that. Um, Again, these are concepts. It is not a defined rule that says that these are all archetypes. In fact, you, you really can't define it. And to try and say within tabletop games that there's a defined set of archetypes, you're going to lose your mind. You just can't do that. But what I really want to start with is why archetypes? Why do we even <laughs> have what? archetypes? What are archetypes? I'll do you one better. Why are archetypes? Because I think it's important. No, like, no, you're no, you're you're not wrong. Like Trust whenever, me, I'm usually the one asking that. Like question. <laughs> I would say, any book that you'd open up for a tabletop game that sat uh, probably between, I would say, late '80s mm-hmm. or mid to late '80s, all the way up until probably 2000, mm-hmm. comfortably, within a few pages, you were right into archetypes. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I specifically remember, I think the first time I ever heard the word archetype, like, mm-hmm. used in tabletop role-playing games, was uh, second edition Shadowrun. Yep. When I was in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, because it was the first classless system I'd ever played. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they had a bunch of templates. Uh, it was actually the color pages in mm-hmm. the black and white mm-hmm. book. Where they had uh, really nice illustrations there, along with uh, pre-generated characters, and these were the archetypes. Mm-hmm. The street samurai, the decker, the shaman, mm-hmm. the mage. Yeah. And though it was a classless system, you fit into one of these, one typically. One of these archetypes. Right. Yes. And it's really comes down to something that I think you put very beautifully, which is we as humanity love defining things. Yeah, we yeah. we hate having things be ambiguous. Yeah, I mean, you, you, we don't need archetypes. Like in the strictest sense of the term, we do not need no. archetypes um, in our in our tabletop role playing game. But we we as human beings, we love classifying things. We love having some form of definition. We have some sort of of connection to a larger group. Right. Um, and oftentimes, when we create those definitions, those archetype definitions they're loose they are not bound by rules of genus phylum job whatever categorizations are by their very nature very imperfect things Mm -hmm. um there's a uh there's a great little argument that that i i I love because uh uh you know as a as a trans person i i you know a lot of discussion of like gender and stuff like that comes the binary concepts yeah and you know you get the common argument of like there's only two genders male or female and like okay well what is a woman well like there's no there's no answer to that question because it's a collection of art attributes that kind of total up to woman Mm -hmm. but like biologically there's kind of no such thing. The same way there's no such thing as a fish. Yeah. Like, scientifically speaking, there is no such thing as a fish. Mm-hmm. Fish is a meaningless word. Yeah. It is essentially an archetype <laughs> of a biological creature that is typically found in the water, 
but you know, then you get things like mud skippers and flying fish, and uh, being in the water isn't even a requirement Mm-mm. at that point. No, nope. of two things we still typically refer to as fish. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but if I said, "Hey, can you go to the store and buy some fish?" Whether what? you go into the pet shop or the grocery store, mm-hmm. you're we're pretty sure what you're going to come home with. You're going to get some salmon. You're going to come home with a couple goldfish in a bag or something Can like that. Can of tuna. And no. we will all agree that what you've got there is a fish. But, like, scientifically speaking, it's really difficult to define something just by using a word that says this is a catch-all that, that refers to all of these things. And architects yeah. are really kind of the same way. Like, you can't really define everything under neat little phylum of you know of archetypes Mm -hmm. and stuff such like that but so so what good are they you know i mean they help us right and that's the thing is is that when we when we step into any type of game we need some definitions to know what our task is to do Mm -hmm. we need to know that this is a die and this is a board and when i roll the die on the board i move my avatar aka my icon my figurine whatever it may be a whole litany of names there Mm -hmm. you know that all are generally meaningless but mean the same thing simulacrum yeah exactly to define what i should be doing within this role Mm -hmm. and so a lot of us come point back to the holy trinity you know of warrior mage rogue or tank healer dps depending on how you you call it you know but there's also, like, besides the fighty and the smart, there's the talky and the sneaky, right? Mm-hmm. Because if I'm not only doing combat, if that's not my, if that's not the definitional set mm-hmm. that we have to segregate based upon, we need to include other optional aspects. And for that, we need to redefine what the archetype is. Hacker, so, hitter, grifter, thief, mastermind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So each system tends to, cre- within its own mechanics, establishes what it's required to play it. Mm-hmm. And then archetypes just assist in defining what those needs are, but doesn't say that they are required. So that's the difference is, is that even though the system denotes what it needs, the archetypes aren't defining that you must. You must have one of these and you mm-hmm. must have one of those. They are merely a guide. <laughs> They're more of a guideline. As I would say. <laughs> you know, so like D&D has classes, mm-hmm. but there's nothing in D&D that says you must have a this and a this and a this. If anything, they, they've actually even started taking out requirements for, for things in, yeah. their, in their classes and whatnot. You know, uh, back in the day, paladins used to be required uh, lawful good. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, that's not even a requirement. Mm-mm. You can absolutely have... Like, they're, they're just holy warriors, essentially, yeah. at this point. Yeah. Nothing saying that can't be a chaotic god or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, um. Yeah, and then you got like what Powered by the Apocalypse has play cards. Yep, yep, very much so. Um, and all of the versions are different. Yeah, <laughs> wildly different in some uh, cases. Mouse Guard, you've you've kind of, you, and this is I, Mouse I, Guard I, has some interesting archetypes in it. Yeah, I kind of want to come back to that one for uh-huh. a specific reason. But like Palladium did occupational character classes, OCCs, yeah, which is effectively jobs. Yeah, with with a little flavor, just a little, yeah, but not much. But again, it was up to you to flavor those. Mm-hmm. Like here's your, like, and it didn't say you had to have one of each of these. For this to play out right, sure. It just said, "Here's your occupational options." So each time you were getting a different look and feel for that definition within the framework of those mechanics. The real thing that comes out of that is, and and you started to allude to that is, why do players like archetypes? Because they 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 act as some sort of guidepost. Well, my argument to you is this. I don't think they, I think the book defines them a certain way, but I think players need them because a lot of times when we first step into playing, Mm -hmm. you are being yourself Mm -hmm. in a different mode. In a, maybe you're, you know, physically different. Maybe you have a different job. Maybe your education is different. Maybe your finances are different, right? Maybe I'm physically more powerful, right? Maybe I have superpowers, but in essence, It's me in a different life. And what archetypes do is it helps you figure yourself out within that role. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it gives you kind of a little leg up to say, oh, I can see myself in that person. Yes. And that's the difference, at least as far as I can see from a player's perspective. As we move on from that, though, and we start 
learning to play a character other than ourselves, we take aspects of ourselves and throw it within an archetype and mix it up with a bunch of lore and a 50-page document of our backstory, you know, <laughs> our deep and broken backstory, and create something new whole cloth. But very early on, and often in systems that we're uncomfortable with, we tend to take a large portion of ourselves into it yeah. and carry it through. Yeah, And that just gives us a guideline mm-hmm. to be able to see in the foggy mirror a little different version of ourselves, our cosplaying version of ourselves, yeah, sure. if you will. The question is, does that help storytelling? Uh, I mean, I've, I've definitely got some opinions on this one, but uh, I, I, I wrote a big a big part of it a little further down in the show notes I here, think so you I don't did. know if you want to hit what you, what you well, did Well, I'm here. just going to say, as far as from the storyteller's aspect, class archetypes kind of give us a focus to look on, the gives us a lens to look at the players with. The NPCs, on the other hand, we don't need to pigeonhole. We're making those whole cloth. Yeah. We don't want them to be fined by classes. The last thing we want are players to literally see the matrix code of fighter, rogue, wizard, whatever. Right, right. right. It, that's, a, that's just another dude. Right, you right. Know? Like, this isn't a, I'm laying down my card in front of you and you're tapping yours because you know you can affect my card. Like, no, that's not how this game is being played. Yeah. This is a story. Yeah. My character is a ruler or they're a creator. So we go back to those core archetypes. They're the old man, mm-hmm. the wise old man. You know, they are the humble uh, baker. You know, and things like that. So that way we can let the story craft who they are. Well, if you're using like the, uh, uh, I've, I've talked about this and it was a long time ago, actually, mm-hmm. in the show, uh, the, the Talos and Jaffe uh, uh, way of doing uh, NPCs is yeah. the seven dwarves. Yep, yep. Just just pick one, you know, and make that kind of its dominant personality trait. It doesn't have to be thus that, that dwarf, you know, mm-hmm. in, in whole, obviously, because then you only get seven options. But just giving them personality traits of them, you know, and stuff like that. But it, at least those are still, you know, certain archetypes you can overlay on your NPCs mm-hmm. to add a little more flavor, to add a little more definition to them. The only challenge that we run into then later on is when players tend to hinder that storytelling by shifting from the archetype. Mm. I am the pacifist fighter, right? You know, where I'm I'm a monk, but I'm a pacifist. Mm-hmm. So I don't use my combat abilities, right? I use them in a defensive ways. I only use the backside of my blade, you know, things like that. You're still a fighter. I assure you, you're still a fighter. When I push you hard enough, you're going to be a fighter. And and that's the difference is, is that we look at it as a, as a negative oftentimes when we're stepping into something like that. Mm-hmm. But I... I I, be- I beg and say, take a look at it again and remind yourself that when a player plays against their archetype, it is your job to remind them that that's their archetype. Make Batman want to shoot somebody, you know, or break a leg. You know, make make the uh, uh, make the fighter who's pa- the pacifist need to protect somebody with the sharp side Mm -hmm. you know that edge of things you know that that's the kind of point that you want to get to to push things and storytelling's hard like it's like archetypes are not meant to make things easy for you but they can but they absolutely can so i'm gonna push off to say because i think you hit it square in the head with why they're not that great. Yeah, so, just like everything else, there are upsides and downsides to archetypes. And I it agree. really all depends on, on on how they're being used and what you depend on them to do, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so, I want to look at the bad bad first. Sure. Because I want to end on a, on, a, on a happy note. Always. Um, okay, so, what do archetypes do for us that is, that is counter-current to, you know, to, to productivity here? All right. First off, they're pigeonholes. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and it's one of the big reasons why, like, um, you know, categorization may not be that bad, or may may, may not be that good. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a com- I mean, even even in in personality types and such like that, you you hear people say, well, what do you, you know? Why do you have to label everything? Mm-hmm. Well, because you know, at least in so- in society, it gives us like a a, a a group of people to identify with and stuff like that, and it helps us learn and identify about ourselves. And that can be true, but at the same time, then if you you can you can get pigeonholed by your label. Well, I dare say that even just in beyond the label, when you look at a character archetype mm-hmm. going to level twenty and being a specific arrow in a direction, 
some people get horse blinders. That's where they want to be. Yep. They don't look at their character's natural development. They force it along a line. Exactly. Exactly. And even if you're not talking about like a character class, right? And I know those are probably the most the most typical archetypes that we're that we're dealing with here. But even if we're looking at things like the, just just your typical roles, mm-hmm. like like a fighter mm-hmm. with with a lowercase f, you know, mm-hmm. just someone who's main profession is combat Mm -hmm. okay um the muscle of the group the Mm -hmm. hitter okay and these take place in all sorts of different games even classless systems Mm -hmm. um at my particular table in my savage worlds game which is a classless system um we have two fighters Mm -hmm. in the group we have regar and we have karu one uses a bow one uses a great sword um so by narrowly defining what role your character fills by Mm -hmm. saying I am the fighter, Mm -hmm. okay? Either by design or by choice, you remove the flexibility and uh, uh, and depth and dimension of Mm -hmm. your character. I would agree. Um, Because you start removing options. You Mm -hmm. say, this is the thing that I do, so that's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that I can do. Um, And if the role that you're filling doesn't feature in the story i.e. you're the face of the group, but, like, the adventure is in the wilderness in a dungeon crawl and you never run into anybody to do social stuff with, mm-hmm. uh, then you're going to feel, you know, unsatisfied and useless. Which is another common thing all the time is is that, you know, you've got a, you have a game where you have two fighters and two mages and a, you know, and a political character. You know, be it a lord or, mm-hmm. or something to that degree, who is there being the face and the money and the talkie, mm-hmm. and they're all put in a ballroom scene at a dining table, and a good two thirds of the group feels pointless. Yeah. They're just struggling to have any reason to even be in the room. We're just going to sit back while the social character does the social character thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or worse, they want to upset the apple cart. Because they're bored. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And then on the converse of that, from the storyteller side of the of, of, of the table, you have to accommodate that archetype. Mm-hmm. Okay, so provide justification for each person's archetype. The storyteller must provide uses for their role. Mm-hmm. I.e., we've got two fighters in my tabletop group in my Tamriel game. Mm-hmm. I kinda have to throw combat in every so and then because. Otherwise, these characters who have defined themselves as the fighters of the group, they've got edges that they've spent their advances on that enhance their combat abilities. Mm -hmm. Their skills are in their fighting skill and their shooting skill. So to essentially justify those characters, we have to keep combat in as an option. Now, it's the type of game I'm running. Mm-hmm. That we will have combat every so and then as an option, like mm-hmm. absolutely, like that's that's not a huge thing for me. But if you get too great of a disparity between the goals of the storyteller and the archetypes being represented at your table, it can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. Where you've got a character out there who's like, well, I want to, uh, you know, I want to, I want to build a corporation or something like that, and you're like, this is a dungeon crawling game. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can accommodate a CEO archetype, an yeah. entrepreneur archetype. Yeah. Or it's like, we're doing a dungeon crawl game in this city. I'm a pirate. Um, I, I didn't say there was naval combat anywhere in this. I'm a pirate. Right. I have a bunch of naval skills. Why don't I get to use those? Because when we started this game, I said we were doing dungeon crawls. Yeah. Are there any waters in the dungeon? Because I want to sail them. <sighs> Not big. I'm big enough you can put a sailboat in them, buddy. Yeah. But in, even in classless systems, like Savage World, we run afoul in a different direction. Mm-hmm. And that is is that when everyone can be involved, people who believe they are a role often feel like they're being ignored. Mm-hmm. Because now everyone can be part of it because it's a narrative story where everyone can do something. Exactly. So now they're like, like I'm the cleric. I should be fighting the undead. Mm-hmm. Yet the whole group is murdering them in yeah. front of me. Yeah. O- okay. That's well, sure. That actually happened. It vampires did. in the sewers. You, I think, hit one dude, hit one the, dude. Entire, the entire time. There was like nine vampires down there. Yep. 
And the group just rolled them and then chased them down. And then chased them down, yeah. And then it turned into a chase scene when the uh, when the master vampire actually showed up, yeah. Yeah. And but and that's the thing is that often then turns the table on what you felt was your archetype. Mm-hmm. Like archetype, like I'm the cleric and the undead slayer per se. Why wasn't I allowed to do my thing? I don't think it wasn't that you were allowed to. I didn't was that, care. It was that circumstance but... didn't unfold that way. Right. And really, the how, how much that matters then depends right. entirely on, like you said, you didn't care. Mm-hmm. And that's the only reason that wasn't a problem. Right. Because, but, but that's not going to be for every table. If you get True, too attached, or every situation. If you get too attached to your archetype. Right. Especially if it's a self-defined one in like a classless system where you're like, well, I built the cleric. So I should do cleric stuff, you know, mm-hmm. then you start feeling cheated out of it. And that and, can and that can cause some problems, especially when there's a lot less communication going on. Mm-hmm. And and this is why we always say, like, when you're watching your players, watch to see if they're archetyping themselves, mm-hmm. regardless of what's actually being involved in the system, the mechanics, whatever. Sure. If your players don't care about their archetype, that they're running rough shot, doing whatever, trying to be whatever they want to be then you're probably okay to not worry about it as much. Worry about what kind of fun they want to have. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you've got a whole table full of rough shots who are doing whatever they want, but one or two of the players are like brand new and they believe this is what their character is, Mm -hmm. not unlike our healer in our mouse guard game, they're seeing themselves as an archetypical healer. Yeah. Yeah. But the opportunities to flourish in our the way we play and the situations we've been presented with doesn't give them much chance to shine. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not calling out our storyteller does an incredible job, mm-hmm. but it's an oversight that's, that's easily done anywhere. Sure. Absolutely. So in situations like that, it is easy to get lost in the story and forget that you may have a player who needs some archetypical Guidance, but I'm glad you bring that that example up. Um, I'm going to elaborate on that one a little bit more because nobody else was at our mouse guard games. So I don't know. What we're by talking all means, about. by all means. Um, but this does kind of lead us into where archetypes are good from from both the player and storyteller standpoint. I agree. Um, and first off, a defined role. Yes. Okay. Um, especially for new players, mm-hmm. having a defined role in the group can be very, very freeing. Okay. Um, I am one of those people who absolutely freezes when you tell me I can do anything. Yeah. And I can only imagine that uh, I'm in good company, especially with new tabletop players Mm -hmm. out there across the world. You end up with what's called analysis paralysis, um, where, you know, you can do anything. Okay, cool. What's the right choice? Oh, whatever you want. No, darn it. I'm asking for help. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to do whatever the hell I want. I want to do the thing that makes sense, but I don't know what that is. Even in the Nova Praxis game, they just give it, play whatever you want to play. No, no, no. What what is this game about? It's about some stuff. Okay, I I need some guidance here. Well, what it's about will be defined by largely by your characters. Okay, now we're in a reciprocal loop. The yeah. game's <laughs> going to be defined by our characters, but the characters need to be defined by the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it knocks in the box. I know. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of talking to and around him in the live chat right well, now. Well, not only that, but <laughs> like he's, Nox, he's the exact same way. Nox is not the only one out there. This is not a small. This is cluster. not. This is not an uncommon problem. This is so. It, I'm just going to say this. If you're listening right now. And you're feeling it, and you're like, you go, because this is me. You are not alone. Yeah, there are so... I, mean, I would actually say this is probably the default. Like, yeah. I would I would say it's probably more rare to find the person who thrives in an environment without boundaries mm-hmm. and can just tell a story. Yeah. Like, those people are usually the people who are, like, theater or improv or, you know... Uh, writers, mm-hmm. you know, people with that, like, a strong creative bent to them. Yeah. Uh, you are going to be the type of people who can just be like, oh, yeah, just, I don't care. Just give me, just give me a character. I'll just sit down and start telling the story. I don't even care what the system is. Yeah. You know, I don't care who the players around me are. I feel good in this character in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, most of us, we we need a little guidance. What do mm-hmm. we do? What mm-hmm. do we do in the group yeah. in relation to our other characters, you know? Yeah. Um, when I was in your D and D game, mm-hmm. uh, uh, now mind you, I was playing an evoker wizard, which was my class, mm-hmm. 
But my role was essentially blaster caster. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had two wizards. Yeah. Now we could have both been blasting, blaster casting. Um, and you know, Memnon dropped, definitely dropped the, the occasional disintegrate. Yeah. Uh, from time to time and more power to him. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Um, but the the role that I had in that group was essentially if something needed smiting mm -hmm. with magic, mm -hmm. I, that's what that's what I did. Yeah. I controlled the elements. Uh, I didn't have to worry about politics. Nope, because that 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 archetype was already filled. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have to worry about religious implications of things. Mm -mm. That archetype was already filled. Deep magic lore, divination, information, all the like mm -hmm. collegiate wizard stuff. My character was a hedge witch, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> grew up on a mountain. Top. Practically a sorcerer based on like pure skill, like driven from the cold winter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and I didn't have to worry about physical combat either because that was Torok, yep. you know. Um, my character was just there to essentially be the girl next door who could freeze people into glaciers. Yeah, who, had a, who, who basically had a, a sawed-off frozen shotgun on her shoulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I was the muscle of the group, and I really enjoyed it because it was a very clearly defined role mm -hmm. of like, oh, God, guys, lots of a, a huge horde of enemies comes in, and Ravana's just there cracking her knuckles, mm -hmm. going like, okay, hey, this is, this is my job. This is the thing that I do in the group. Mm -hmm. I felt comfortable in that role, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I felt comfortable with other people in their roles. Yeah. Um, likewise, when you've got defined roles, you can kind of ensure that nobody duplicates a character. Mm -hmm. Now, in your, like I said, in your D&D &D game, everybody kind of had their own niches. Yep, very much so. You know? Um, we have, uh, a kind of this problem in my game, mm -hmm. where when we switched over to Savage Worlds, we had the Bard Warlock and the Fighter Sorcerer kind of ended up making the same character. On paper. Like, on paper. Mm -hmm. Now, they are vastly different personalities with vastly different goals and interests and whatnot. But if you're looking at just stats, they both took the wizard edge, and they both have a really high occult skill, a really high research skill, mm -hmm. um, a good handful just because of the the, the, the wizard edge. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of their spells overlap. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and like on paper, you look at it and you're like, oh, you two are the same. Mm -hmm. How do you not trip over each other constantly? Yeah. It's because they've got different archetypes. Yeah. One is the charismatic wizard, mm -hmm. and the other is the, like, absent-minded blaster caster. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And so this doesn't shift hard for the, the, the same for the uh, storytellers. Like, it creates that gap when you say you can be anything. Mm -hmm. How do you define the direction of your story when they can literally write anything? Right, right. Your characters can can do or be anything. So how do you how do you tell stories? Or to especially those when you have a bunch of people who are very excited to play very very different things. Mm -hmm. And now you're like, I want to. I don't want to tell them no. I don't want to disclude them. I don't want to pigeonhole them into def you know, into the first book and only base classes. But this story needs a plot that unifies this group on a yeah. common goal here. And if they're all doing different things, then I mean, how do you write for that? Yeah. How do you string a plot together? So having archetypes where you can just be like, okay, I know at least the core of your character. Yep. Is this, mm -hmm. and I know what I can do for that. You mm -hmm. know. Um, it also, like, in kind of the converse of what I said, where, like, if you've got a fighter in your group, it obligates you to put combat in the game, mm -hmm. so that, that fighter has something to do. Dead honest, though, that's also an advantage. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, I know how to make two car two out of my six players happy and feel useful. Yeah. Throw a fight at you guys. Yeah. I mean, the rest of you won't be bored either, I guarantee it, but, you know. Yeah. And it, I think the only thing that brings around to me in my, my in my framework is is that when we're dealing with games that are more open and yet still have a uh have a clean uh a, a clean playbook if you will it it presents the the question of how do you create cohesion and sometimes the system does it for you shadowrun does it as you're a bunch of runners 
Mouse Guard does it as you are all members of the guard. Mm -hmm. And so in storytelling, that is a, a good way to reframe your thinking as the storyteller like you did. You must be either a member of the Fighters Guild or the Mages Guild. And there is your there is the storytelling archetypes mm -hmm. for you to have and be able to work with. These are your tool sets now as the storyteller. It doesn't matter what the players are making. That's your opening gambit. Yeah. You don't have to fight with anything else. You don't have to make up any sort. What are the fighter and, and Mage. Mage's Guild going to do together? Right. And then... These are the people they pick to do that job what, for whatever reason. And then uh, and then that, you know, all, all your players need to think is what archetypes fill those roles? Yeah. What what is the archetype of a fighter in this world? What is the archetype what are the archetypes of a mage in this world? Right. So <laughs> I laugh because I literally brought that up as technically just talking about like what do you do in a uh uh, a, a situation where you're all pirates or you're all, you know, you know, your friend was talking about a game with you're all thieves, you know, play Blades in the Dark. <laughs> but, you just say Blades in the Dark, it's fine. But the point of the, the thing is, is that the moment that they create the archetype, they mm -hmm. define it as such, or you figure out what that is, the group archetype, oh, you're all thieves, we're playing Leverage. Yeah. You know, or we're playing Heist. All right, let's go steal a role-playing game. Yeah. Like, sure. And... People, I, 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 I've been reading this a lot. We have some lovely writers on our Discord who have mm -hmm. been building amazing worlds. Oh, yeah. All of your worlds are places to play in. They are the tables and mats and hexes that are defined for whatever avatars get placed on them. So if it's a bunch of thieves that get dropped in your city, you're crafting a story within that world. For those people, and they only see what they see. Keep that in your frame instead of defining, like, what would it be different if Star Wars Episode One's setting, where you have a galactic war, a rebellion going on, and an evil empire that is trying to squash said rebellion so that they can take over the, take over the entire galaxy, mm -hmm. and everyone decides to play thieves what's the story well my, my thought was that they were going to be part of the rebellion okay i guess you're going to have to reframe your plot mm -hmm. stop writing the plot until the players have defined themselves but if you know they're all thieves you can say who needs thieves the rebellion probably needs thieves sure they might need some i don't know plans stolen yeah <laughs> Oh, I'm pretty sure there was a mention of that somewhere in one of the Star Wars movies. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. But the whole point of the matter is just that, is that you're defining a beautiful, beautiful world. Mm -hmm. That is great. Nothing wrong with that. Just be prepared that when your players define themselves, that you figure out what they are as a whole. Yeah. What's their group archetype? Mm -hmm. And then once you have that, everything else falls into place. Yeah. Then you can play around with messing with the characters and getting to know the players and pushing all of their red buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Technology says we prefer the term specialists. <laughs> Special. Keyword there. <laughs> at least early on. At least early on. Yeah. Um, we actually hit a lot of these questions very quickly. Yeah, you um, kind you kind of use Nevim's questions as a checklist. What are the ar what's the difference between archetype, a stereotype, and a trope? You literally covered that, that one right out. Uh, is using a predefined archetype in character creation helpful or limiting? Yes um, and no and yes. Okay, so we we <laughs> I could I could elaborate on this one a little bit more because sure. I think we talked about how they how they end up happening at the table. Yes. Um, but not kind of where they sit in the character creation step. Um, and I, this is kind of where I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, Wendy's character in our uh, yeah. in our, our Mouse Guard game. Um, I just realized I never never elaborated on I that. I was going to bring it back up. Uh, so uh, at character creation, she decided she was going to be um, a, a healer of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's no magic in Mouse Guard, so mm -hmm. this is really more of like a doctor yeah. that we're looking at. Um, Kyrgyzian. My character had... Uh, taken a pretty bad dose of a chemical um and for a period of time was pretty sick over it and i just kind of decided to make that a defining character trait of my character with the mm -hmm. plan that i discussed with the storyteller to retire my character at the end of the season yep um that this a, a developing plot would be that my character became sicker and sicker 
um, mm-hmm. from the lasting effects of this. And uh, so when Wendy created her character, she wanted to do a healer that was essentially assigned to our guard to uh, make sure, essentially, that I that I took my meds and mm-hmm. was okay. My my personal nurse, essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. And that was great because we so so we took the healer archetype, that doctor archetype, mm-hmm. um, and and built this character for her. And it gave, especially as a first time uh, role player, mm-hmm. this is her very first role playing game, or maybe second, but the first one was not good. Um, so for first game that she's enjoying, mm-hmm. um, and I would absolutely say having that archetype. Not knowing what the rules are, not only only kind of understanding how the uh, the uh, the world works mm-hmm. and where their character is going to fit into all of it, um, especially to a new player, having an archetype to say like, okay, this is the thing that I'm trying to build mm-hmm. with these rules. Now I kind of know where I'm going to put my skill points. Now I kind of know where I'm gonna what gear I'm gonna take. Right, right, right. You know, I can think about what sort of. Um, events have crafted my character's personality mm-hmm. who my friends might be who my enemies might be right you know um and so yeah i think that's that's absolutely helpful um the question is is it is it useful is it helpful or limiting and i think it only becomes leaning into an archetype during character creation is only limiting if you don't let it go when you need to yeah. Okay. And that kind of gets me to the second part of the story, which was this last game session. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of, an, uh, of, a, of a session of Mouse Guard, you have to write down a goal mm-hmm. for your character. And depending on whether or not you reach that goal, um, and this is a personal goal, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not always like whatever the mission is. It might just seriously be like dunk on my rival as many times as possible. Right, but there was a snake attacking the colony. I don't care. I'm yeah. going to use this opportunity to dunk on my rival as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and if you do that, you get points, basically. You get a check, the, yeah. Yeah, for, for your character. Yeah. Um, or something, yeah. So, at the beginning of the game session, we're asked to all write our own personal goals. And Wendy was having a hard time with it. Mm-hmm. Um... And so one of the things we did was we we kind of, you know, told her, like, well, look, always look to your instinct and your belief as your guideposts. Those Mm -hmm. are things that are written on your character sheet of how your character thinks and acts in in most situations. Mm -hmm. What their what their guiding, you know, guiding light is to how to approach the world. Sure. Um, But there was a bit of a discussion that took place of like, okay, you know, you're the healer, but you as a player are feeling like you want to be more involved because being a healer has led to you sitting back and being cautious and not diving into the fun things that are happening to everyone else around you. Mm -hmm. And that's a very valid, very fair thing to feel as a character. Mm -hmm. And so at that point is her archetype of a healer helping or hindering. I think in that point, because it's not character creation at that point. Mm-hmm. It's character development. And I think at that point it does. Mm-hmm. It does hinder you. Because, again, it's a start point. Your character creation is always a start point. Exactly. That should change as you evolve within the story. Exactly. Um, a couple things. I mean, first first off, character um, development is a thing. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's a very important thing that your character learns and changes and grows with experience. Yes. Um. But also, I mean, just from a role playing standpoint, no character survives contact with the story. Nope. We all we all have ways that we think our character is going to play out when we create them in our mm-hmm. head, mm-hmm. whether that's an archetype or a character concept or whatever you want to call it. But once a character hits the table and starts getting acted upon by the other characters in the story, you'll find that, that character changes a lot from yeah. your core, your original vision for them. Yeah. And so oftentimes it's very it's very important once you're in the bits of the story to look at that archetype that you had when you started and go, does this still apply? Yeah. Do I need to look at my character's belief or my instinct and change them? Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the things that comes to my mind is there's uh, there are a lot of doctors, mm-hmm. physicians that 
turn out very differently after they become doctors. Yeah. Um, one of the key ones in my mind frame that immediately hit me was because I, I just rewatched a scene of it is um, Sherlock Holmes talking to Watson about who he is. Mm -hmm. Like, like, wh why do you do this, Watson? It's because you have a perverse need to be in danger. It's huh. what you crave. Yeah. It doesn't make you a bad person, but you really want to be near dangerous people in dangerous situations because you need that to survive. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you fall apart yeah. and you're bored and you hate it. Yeah. You'll run into combat because you need it. That's one kind of a doctor. Yeah. Not to say that they're like, we look at the doctor in Firefly. Mm -hmm. Yes, he wanted to help people, but his main goal had nothing to do with anyone else other than his sister. Protect, yeah, protect River. Yep. You know, and then even clerics can become kings. And because they see themselves as someone who can help heal at a much higher and broader sense. Mm -hmm. And all of those are different kinds of the same start point. Best defense is good offense. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I want to protect everybody. How do I do that? By eliminating the danger. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. That's yep. that's valid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, just, just a, it's it's good to take, you know, look back on what has happened, how your character has been shaped, and see if that, just double check. Just double check mm -hmm. and see if that archetype is still valid. Yeah. And if not, make make whatever changes you need to. Yep. Um, I'm going to roll back just a second here because I, I want to... I kind of want to examine this because I think it's important. Okay. Knox in, in chat had said, um, I need labels when I'm lost to know how to act sometimes. But then acting that way just f because it fits the label sometimes makes me wonder if I'm acting in a disingenuous way. So understanding that, like, if I'm a fighter, but I'm not doing fightery things... Mm -hmm. Am I being disingenuous to the archetype fighter? And the answer right. is no. You're developing. You're becoming yourself. You know, um, in Stardust, the captain of the, sh the airship who goes and captures lightning in bottles and sells it mm -hmm. with his crew of cutthroat pirates. Captain Shakespeare. Yes. Yeah. Enjoys a very soft life mm -hmm. in truth and wishes to just retire one day maybe on a bay with a fruity drink to live deliciously yeah because he loves life yeah he doesn't he has to have a certain feeling to keep his position and to make sure that they stay on top in their career mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a core to himself that's a different truth yeah sure you know, that he enjoys romance and dance mm -hmm. and and colorful clothing. Yeah. Why not? Right? And it doesn't make him any less of a fighter or a captain. Mm -hmm. It just makes him a person. Yeah. And that's the truth, is that you're not being disingenuous to the archetype. The only reason why you'd be disingenuous is if you believe that the motivation that drives your character has changed. And in that, you have to decide... Have you grown? Yeah. Or are you just following something because you're echoing it? Is this the new archetype? Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and just from a, from a personal standpoint, too, um, like, man, that's valid as heck for, for real-life interactions. Like, there's no guidebook for any of this stuff. None. Uh, so whatever way you act is the way you're, you know, like it, that's, that's genuine, man. Unless you're doing it with a, with a specific intent to be duplicitous, then don't, don't worry about being disingenuous. You're, you're perfectly fine. Also, I'm going to say this. If that's in your headspace that you're thinking about it that way, then you're not being disingenuous. Then you're not being. And guess what? You may get called out on that by your foil in the game. Who's just like, what kind of a fighter are you? Mm-hmm doing these things okay that, that sounds like fighting words <laughs> yeah it, it sounds like a it sounds like a core change to your character sounds like a personal plot to me mm -hmm. um 
and and technology had a question about archetypes uh, similarly or contrasted against allegory or symbolism. And I'm going to say that there are some clear definitions of it, but understand that the main purpose of an allegory is to tell a story that has characters that use different types of symbols or archetypes that have both literal and figurative meaning. So don't think, don't confuse allegory with archetype in any way. Yeah, uh... Allegories use archetypes and symbols. Like, the X-Men is an allegory for the, you know, for, for, for gay rights. Like, Very much so. Absolutely, you know? Yeah, and in, in each one of the characters is not an archetype, direct symbolism, or or anything like symbolistic... Uh, symbolistic, wow, I said that. Or, or has any symbolism... Symbolism. Symbolism of anything in particular within the framework mm -hmm. but at different times they become symbols of different things yeah uh, as yeah. necessary within the story framework i, I would say yeah allegory is more about the story archetypes more about the characters in the story correct and archetypes are symbols 100 mm percent. -hmm. that is that is it with you you can't distinguish them to not be it's just a matter of an archetype is a symbol when utilized within literature that's the only difference there. So, um, so don't don't feel like you need to to be involved. Understand that we are or keeping this very simple in the sense that archetypes are a guideline to assist you, and it is a concept and nothing more. Once it has definition by either uh, uh, drive, direction, motivation, it is no longer an archetype. It is now some. It is beyond concept. Mm -hmm. It is now into character. So. Have we beaten this horse? I think so. I think we're. I hope we're everybody good. feels solid about this. If you have questions, bring them to our Discord. We had a whole bunch of new people join us. We really appreciate that. Whenever people come on and talk to us about their worlds and their ideas and what questions they have. Yeah, was it somebody just dropped? Oh god, I, I'm I'm kicking myself. Was it Violent Menace that uh, just dropped like an entire Cortex Prime uh, like pirate setting? Yes, yes. On, on the Discord, along with like all the PDFs for it. Yeah, if you're looking, if you're looking for some some piratey goodness and swashbuckling has come up so many times in so many places yep violent menace yep. yes come come hop on our discord take a look at what violent menace is uh, positioned it's a great start point it's in the it's in the homebrew channel if you want to see it it's uh privateers and buccaneers yeah yeah it's fantastic so so it is our first week of the first show of the the month of july mm -hmm. um that means it's going to be a storytelling 202 yeah, I love doing those. We are going to be talking Seems about fun. plots from the villain's perspective. Now, we've talked about villains. We've talked about plots. We've talked about questionable things that mix the two of them. Mm -hmm. We've never really focused on doing a plot from their perspective. Mm -hmm. So the idea of pulling together the setting while the world is upside down like you normally see it, but instead change your view a little bit. See why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And you might get a little different way to craft your story versus trying to fit a villain into an existing world setting that you've developed that they might not fit into. Yep. So. That's exciting. I love I loved talking about villains. <laughs> so good. Anyway, you can find us on Twitter at ST underscore Conclave, on Instagram at ST underscore Conclave. Listen to us live every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time on mixlr.com slash storyteller dash Conclave. And uh, join us on Discord, the aforementioned uh, Discord, where all these great storytellers are sharing their stories, sharing their advice, uh, apparently dropping whole systems in we our homebrew it. channel. Um, we absolutely love it. We'd love to hear from you, get some good questions. Uh, you can find that link on our Twitter as well as our website, storytellerconclave.com. We'd like to thank all of our Patreon members who support us every month, and we're always looking for more. It helps us expand, grow, and continue finding people and bringing them into the Conclave. Uh, especially our name members I'd like to thank, Knox in the Box, Subject, Sam, The Arcane Asylum, Sparkle Motion, Veteran, Hulu, Boo, and Sean. We truly appreciate your support. 
Our pre-show music is by Arcane Anthems. You can find them at patreon.com slash arcane anthems or on Instagram at arcane anthems. Our intro music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. You can find it at geefrog.bandcamp.com or on Google Music. And our outro music, which you're hearing right now, is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine. You can find them at freemusicarchive.org. And a big shout out as always to our families, Vicky and Sean. Thank you so much for loving and supporting us. Thank you. All of our friends have sat at our tables over these years to give us great stories to share with you and you, every single one of our listeners. We love you guys so much. Love you guys. Good night. Good night.